their, their thought process with. And so, so this, this, I think, is very interesting at trying to bridge those two worlds. So, Alexander, over to, over to you. Thank you. So, one second. Uh, I'm extending. I'm going to try to figure that out. Um, cool. So in the spirit of getting rid of PDFs, um, I'm Alexander, a software engineer based out of Chicago, uh, currently applying to programs this quarter, or this cycle. Uh, this is some research I've been doing in collaboration with Andrew Blinn and Cyrus Omar at the University of Michigan Future Programming Lab uh, on why the future of planetary compute engines should be live, rich, composable, and collaborative. Let's jump into exactly what that means. So planetary compute engine is a term we got from this paper, A Case for Planetary Computing, that came out of the Cambridge Center for Carbon Credits. To summarize, uh, the paper advocates for an end-to-end -end computing platform for facilitating climate analysis, um, including scalable data pipelines to handle processing petabytes of information, um, the ingestion of live sensor data from global and extraterrestrial sensors that are updated throughout time. Uh, the system needs to be accessible for multiple stakeholders. So the breadth of the climate crisis requires climate scientists, CS experts, politicians and executives working in close collaboration to solve these problems. And uh, we need a system that is extensible by vernacular developers. So these are people who uh, may not be CS experts, but they might know how to program, they are experts in their own domain, and they have programming experience, um, but are not by trade software engineers necessarily. Um, and like any scientific analysis, uh, we want results that are traceable and reproducible. Um, so how we got involved, um, Dr. Amanda Papetti gave a talk at ICFP in 2023 uh, and showed the slide where he pointed out that Cyrus Somar's work on Hazel <laughs> could help with usable user interfaces for non-CS experts. Uh, we're also interested if we can have interfaces that help CS experts and non-experts uh, collaborate better together. Um, so I have uh, this chart of kind of three archetypal stakeholders for such a system. Uh, this is not meant to be an exhaustive set of stakeholders, but um, indicate the types of tooling divide that are present. So at the top, you can see a climate scientist using computational notebooks spreadsheets, uh, and programming languages geared towards doing analysis. Uh, a computing expert may be in charge of the computing platform itself, and they're using traditional static code, like a build lifecycle, uh, Kubernetes manifests to define data pipelines. Maybe they're using Airflow or sort of some workflow management tool, um, especially to manage these analyses on shared resources. Uh, and then the end result is PDFs uh, for a, a policymaker so they can receive this information. Uh, if they're lucky, maybe they have interactive visualizations or a competing expert and scientist made a custom application. Um, what we would like to see is something closer to this, where there's a smooth spectrum between these use cases. So each use case is still facilitated. We're not trying to say that those aren't actual problems, but uh, maybe we can have stronger direct collaboration between the stakeholders. And maybe it's possible for a vernacular developer to live somewhere in the middle, uh, as opposed to having to choose, do they want to use the competing experts tools, the scientists tools, or PDFs. Um, Cool. So uh, one framework we think is helpful for reasoning about this is uh, came out of Plateau last year by Horowitz and here on what they call live, rich, and composable. So I'm going to jump into these individually. Uh, so liveness is the ability for the system to provide feedback from the running program during editing. Uh, the representation nearly everyone is familiar with is spreadsheets, where you can clearly see cells evaluate during editing the spreadsheet. Uh, on the bottom left, I have a, can't really see on the TV, but I have a spreadsheet where I was analyzing marine protected uh, areas. Uh, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and then on the bottom right, I have a uh, Jupyter notebook looking at land cover data. Um, I think liveness is like a critical feature in the exploratory phase of data analysis because analysis is by its very nature unguided and requires consistent checking uh, with expectations to make sure things are going how you expect. Uh, and then also because data sets are so large, it's prohibitive to like rerun an entire analysis in batch mode every time you wanna make a change. So I think liveness is something that we definitely need to have. Um, richness is domain-specific representations for editing and interacting with programs. So existing tools and computational notebooks often have the ability to build like, data visualizations, but they kind of fall apart when you're trying to actually edit the data or modify or kind of do uh, more direct program manipulation in terms of domain-specific features. Uh, and especially, you often have to choose if you want those features or if you want an actual full programming environment. Um, given the prevalence of geospatial data in the climate domain, having rich maps and charts seems necessary. Uh, and it's also a major setup uh, step up if you're like normally doing all your analysis in plain text. Um, in the examples below, I have the uh, NOAA Marine Protected Area Viewer, a chart of marine diversity over time, and also from Dr. Menop uh, 
Anil Salk. Uh, uh, I have uh, South American for, uh, deforestation uh, over time. And then composability should be the one that's familiar to most PL researchers. Um, this is the one that's present in all classical programming languages. It allows for smaller artifacts to be built up into bigger ones. Uh, it facilitates code reuse, code sharing, and also economies of scale in software building. So um, we have from uh, X-Array some, you would be able to see if it was clear, from X-Array some coordinate uh, code that's reusable. Um, these are data pipelines also from the ICFP talk uh, that are built out of reusable um, data stages. So uh, kind of be able to compose these analyses into a larger scale uh, problems is useful. And then the data.gov uh, data catalog where you have a lot of uh, data sets that are like um, composed out of smaller historical data sets over time. So I think thinking about like both the data pipeline, the code reuse, and the data composability are all interesting vectors. Uh, and also since the climate crisis is so large, like if we're not using composability to build bigger solutions, I don't think we're gonna get very far. Uh, and then one that's not in the Horowitz and Here paper uh, is collaborative. We're defining collaborative to be um, operate as a shared medium for multiple stakeholders. Um, large data sets and computations uh, also make it unwise to share like naive static artifacts like plain text code because um, a lot of the collaboration is on the analysis and not just the code. Um, this is partially why tools like Jupyter and computational notebooks have become successful in the first place. Um, Git is also great, depending on who you ask, uh, but it ignores both the live editing experience as well as the data sets and live program state that is necessary for true collaboration. Um, existing collaborative programming environments also seem to ignore the problems of application state, which is a major problem in data analysis. Uh, so on the bottom, I have screenshots of a Google Doc and Wikipedia. Uh, we believe that having real-time collaboration uh, would allow for stakeholders to interact with less overhead. And wiki-like functionality allows for consensus building and like the fostering of knowledge bases as a group. So the earlier that we can get consensus on what we're talking about and what we're trying to do, I think the better results will be. Um, cool, so how are we gonna go about solving these problems? Um, our group works on a live functional programming environment called Hazel. Um, Hazel has maximally live um, functional programming. So you can see there's a static type error on this type term on the right, yet you still have evaluation of 424. Um, static type checking. Uh, you can run incomplete programs. You can see the not nitrous oxide example as the third sample uh, has a typed hole in it, so we don't actually know what the data point is, but the program continues around. Uh, and there are no meaningless editor states. Uh, we believe this is important, especially in a collaborative environment where there's nothing you could do in the editor that's gonna result in like a complete parse failure and the program giving up. Uh, you might have some odd results, but execution will always continue and there's always some semantic understanding. Um, and then additionally, so this gives us live and composability. Um, there's a feature as part of Hazel called livelets, which are live and rich uh, domain GUIs uh, that could be embedded directly in the program source code. So here you could see two livelets um, here representing grade data. Uh, you get all the affordances of like a spreadsheet uh, in this first data frame example. And this one allows you to find letter grade cutoffs. And I'll be demoing this in a second, so. Uh, and then Livelets also feature splices, which create composability. So inside these GUIs, you could have embedded sub-expressions of code or uh, Livelets themselves. So let me attempt to make this way smaller. I'm just going to do it like this. So let's say we want to get all the carbon dioxide emissions. Actually, I am gonna to switch to mirroring displays real quick if that's okay with everyone. So you can see at the bottom, I haven't defined the function, so it just shows up as a question. Oh, sorry. Is that big enough for everyone? A little bit bigger? Uh, yeah, so the question, because the function's not defined, the question mark shows up and evaluation continues. But if we define a function, and we want to do a case analysis on the structure, you can see we now have this incomplete case analysis. So we would like to say, okay, the first case we care about is the carbon dioxide, parts per million. So you can see, um, you can see the samples, but you can see 4, 17, and 7 are here, but we still have an incomplete case analysis for the other cases. So I don't care about those. So I'm just gonna say zero. So now we have a list of all zeros, and we can take the sum of this. 
Great. And we still have this incomplete sample for nitrous oxide. So we think this is interesting both from like the collaborative aspect, but also like you had data um, inconsistencies or lacking data, if you could represent that, um, this is useful. And then uh, one of the things I think is cool is let's say we're still adding stuff to our expression and let's say we have a carbon dioxide sample that's empty. You can still see all the evaluations happening around and the missing data point is just represented in the output. So um, yeah, this is uh, the latest version of Hazel. Uh, I haven't gotten around to implementing live lights on this one, so I'm gonna switch to an older version that has live lights implemented. Um, out, cool. So this is the spreadsheet with the grades table that I was describing earlier. Is this big enough for everyone? Um, cool, so we're gonna say, what if Cyrus did not finish his final exam? Uh, but he had 10 bonus points. We could see his grade down here. It's not looking too great, uh, but we could say maybe he wants to simulate what it would be like when he was done. And this is the splices I was talking about that let you embed computations inside the other livelets. So now you can kind of see in live updating, uh, if I could drag, what's happening. And on the bottom, you can see on this number line, his grade live updating with me updating the side of the top. So maybe he assumes he's gonna get like a 90. And then you could say, maybe you're the professor, you're trying to see where to curve. You're like, these two data points are really close together, so you don't wanna do that. So you can live update this one as well, adjusting the cutoffs. Uh, we can't see the output. Yeah, but you can see right here where you can see the grades updating in real time. Cool. Is it at Michigan work? Uh, <laughs> I'm not at Michigan, so. <laughs> cool, so yeah, those are splices. Uh, to recap, uh, I also need to go back to my join display. Great, cool. So. Um, Livelets accomplish the live, rich, and composable uh, GUIs, domain representations, write in code. Um, and so what we're going back to the planetary compute engine concept, what we're advocating for is a collaborative computational uh, version of Hazel geared towards planetary computing. Um, livelets would be used to provide live and rich GUIs, which could then be used by both CS experts and novices. Uh, in addition, the inclusion of expository text would allow for shared analyses to be integrated with live data. So that's kind of replacing this PDF concept. Um, and jumping into the mock-up, because I know this is too small. Uh, we can see here we have a data loader, loader livelet for, the, uh, for NOAA. Uh, this would allow easily pulling in new data sources for analysis and potential for ascribing type information to a data set. Uh, the resulting data is then being piped into a table livelet that gives you all the familiar affordances dealing with like a data table. So sorting, filtering, those sorts of things. More interestingly though, you can see at the bottom with these little arrows, we have the opportunity for adding reduction splices for each column which would allow for saying maybe area you just want the mean, so that's a number there, um, that maybe is the mean for that column. But if you want to get quick look at distributions, you could define a pie chart or a histogram livelet, which would allow you to like very easily get a look at the data set. Um, and then if you look at this interaction flow we have described on the right, maybe an advanced user implemented this histogram, uh, but they realized bucketing size might be a thing you'd want to change. So they're exposing that via another livelet with a slider. So that way, a, a more novice user, like a journalist or something, could go through and adjust the bucket size themselves, uh, allowing for this kind of progressive enhancement of technical capability in the system, where you could be a very sophisticated software engineer, a very end user, or somewhere kind of in between. Um, so jumping forward. Now we have a more rich featured application uh, built using LiveWits, uh, where this would take the marine protected areas that we imported earlier. Uh, and create this kind of interactive application that would allow you to define custom regions on a map. And then these regions, uh, calculating like what percentage of each region is which marine protected area and getting some metadata from that. So we believe uh, having all of these livelets integrated into the source code should make it easier to build these composable rich applications. And it's also nice to have any stakeholder can make changes if they want to. Um, and then on the bottom under ecological assessment, uh, this 58% number, uh, isn't actually just plain text, it's linked back to the fully live system. So if a policymaker or some other user wanted to, they could figure out where that data was coming from and um, where the data source is originating. Um, cool. So yeah, so we're envisioning uh, this Planet Hazel as kind of a live computational wiki uh, that uses um, rich domain specific graphical representations integrated comp compositionally into purely functional code which lends itself to compositional abstractions uh, that align well with mathematical reasoning that might be used by data scientists. Um, 
And there are some further concerns. Uh, we can't get everyone to rewrite everything in Hazel, uh, no matter how hard we try. Um, we're thinking that similar to the Cambridge work, Planet Hazel could operate as an orchestration language and integrate with existing systems via FFI, um, also allowing uh, Hazel to remain more purely functional. Um, uh, traceability and reproducibility. Uh, Hazel's purely functional execution model should simplify uh, guarantees around reproducibility. Uh, we could also add incremental computing to the execution model to where if you do get new sensor data, you're not recomputing everything from scratch. Uh, and then an open question is, uh, how do we deal with changing inputs and program modifications, mostly in terms of the UI or UX? Uh, because if you load an analysis and then it looks completely different next time you load it, uh, you want to see like what happened. Uh, and we need to be sure we can expose that in a reasonable way. Um, and then lastly, um, given some of these data sets uh, have like precise locations of protected species, we need a method to restrict access um, while still being as collaborative as possible. Uh, in conclusion, the future of planetary computing should be live, rich, composable, and collaborative. Given the diversity of stakeholders, we need an accessible medium to truly address the climate crisis, uh, and we're proposing uh, or building Planet Hazel as a platform to which we can build upon these ideas. Cool. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? For... I ignored you last time, sorry. <laughs> you win this time. Thank you. This is lovely. Uh, I was slightly concerned when you started changing Cyrus's exam marks. Uh, I, I gave him a good one at the end. I was, I was at least a B. <laughs> No, no, but it, it, more seriously, I was, I was wondering, do you, do you have a means for sort of restricting which data you're actually allowed to edit? So the existing version isn't collaborative that we have now, but the mock-up, I know Andrew was thinking about ways to lock part of code cells, so that maybe there'd be some sort of capability system or some other way to say, like, who's allowed to lock what? Because one of the concerns we also have is if a novice user is, like, directly in the code, they could accidentally break something. Uh, so we've been thinking about ways to lock parts of the ASD. And also, I wonder if people start using this kind of technology pervasively, uh, have you thought of some way of, I don't know, having a certificate to, to prove that the, 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 the data they're presenting actually is what they say it is? Does that make sense? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there was a question there. It's a sort of open-ended question. I, I, it's, it's a thing to worry that, that is sometimes of concern because well, I don't know, politicians, for instance, they're often often presenting charts that, that make them look much better than they are. Oh, you're saying so there's ways um, you can use the data to make it look a certain way. And there's a tension between sort of giving it everyone maximum access to this data and actually um, the village somehow certifying that that data is actually what you, you started with. Yeah, I think kind of having ways to trace data back to their original source. Yeah, so sort of provenance techniques. Yeah. Maybe come in there. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank you. Any other? Um, I'll get this one with us. Hi. Uh, looks like a cool system. Um, if I wanted to use it offline, does that work? And what would I need to install to get it to work? This is still a mock or These versions are real. The Planet Hazel is still a mock up. So we don't have necessary answers for that. We have been talking about using CRDTs for collaborative editing. So that may work in a way for offline support, but if it is an orchestration language with a big like, computing platform behind it, I, that probably wouldn't work on your laptop, but uh, we need to figure out how that's going to uh, work. Sh sh shame, because I, I, I do a lot of work with, uh, on, on a train without much network yeah. access. So yeah. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm always looking for things that work offline. Yeah, well, I mean, if you have a data set that's like a petabyte big, oh, yeah, okay. that, that's an intrinsic problem. Um, but um, could you also just kind of have um, Kind of, could you swap out the data quickly with this? The thing I like about this is being able to kind of like do mocking of parts of your code. Could you just drop in a kind of, if you had a large data set you couldn't access because you were on the train, would it, how easy would it be to swap out part of your computation for a kind of mock-up that was just holding a value until you, and let you still do the rest of your work? That's interesting, so you're saying pre-can the data on the client side to where you can or have a sample set? Yeah, or you, I don't have 150 gigabyte TIFF on my desk, but I, I've got something that'll generate a, that's something that's that shape, and I can just put some canned data into test yeah. code while I edit it. Yeah, so one of the things we thought about, because like obviously the sorting and filtering and that table live lit's not going to work on a petabyte of data in real time, so we were thinking about ways to just extract a sample of the data set. I think figuring out the UX for how to represent what's local and what's remote is probably the harder part, as opposed to like 
the technical implementation details. It's just figuring out how to do that in a way that's clear and obvious what's going on. I want. <laughs> that, that's the coolest thing I've seen in a while. I think, you know, apart from all the climate uses, which are great, I would just like this for teaching my first years. Yeah. But it, how big is the team doing this currently? I think Cyrus can answer that better than I can. So we, we are teaching with a right now, so happy to. Sorry. That's, that sounds cool too, but how many of you are working on this right now? Um, they, I have about 30 undergrads and uh, maybe another dozen open source contributors at the moment. And uh, that's a pretty big team. four or five maybe it was graduate like students. Three of you. What's that? I thought it was maybe like three of you. Well, undergraduates are taking classes, so maybe five hours a week each. So maybe it adds up to, you know, you, a half, do I'm amazed a half you dozen get people. Work out of undergrads, but good for you. <laughs> um, but uh, the serious thing I want to say is we, we've got some people here, like the Cambridge Lab, that has resources. And <laughs> I, think if you're, I hope during the discussion we talk about how to get you more resources. Because <laughs> this is great, but you know, if it's one team, it'll come slowly. Mm -hmm. You get more teams doing it, it will yeah. come faster. I think that, that, I, I that's really, a, really like this I, stuff. I just wanted to say that. Thank you, yeah. I think the, a broader discussion about um, you know, supporting research programmers, which I think was brought up in, in the prior talk, uh, is actually really important in this field, right? There's a bunch of engineering needs beyond the, the research needs. So I'm happy to talk more about that, yeah. Um, cool, well, in which case, uh, we're about to change form, but before we do that, can we please thank Alexander? Thank you.